has become a legend, a victim of tragedy, who emerges as a symbol of justice. What the hell are you? I'm Batman. But what drives a billionaire to become a crime-fighting vigilante? You got an angry man in pain, seeking purpose in his life. And how do Batman's motivations reflect our own? He is struggling with the very things that you and I struggle with every day. Now, go inside the mind of a superhero. His whole life is a quest to restore meaning. As we use the real-life tools of analysis. There's a technique for people who have fears. It's called exposure. To unlock the psyche of Bruce Wayne, Batman, and the villains who symbolize our darkest desires. I am going to stop you. You're just a freak. Like me. Hey. It's nice. What? What the hell? Crime Fighter. <laughs> Avenger. Vigilante. Hero. Batman is as complex as he is contradictory. Bruce. Rachel's told me everything about you. No, I certainly hope not. Exploring his character can be a revealing test for the viewer. Because in Batman, we can find the heroism, the fear, and the darkness inside us all. The brainchild of creator Bob Kane. Batman debuted in the pages of Detective Comics in 1939. It was the decade of the Great Depression, urban expansion, and violent crime. Since then, billionaire Bruce Wayne and his masked alter ego have been shown as everything from a mob-crushing crime fighter to a kid-friendly superhero. But by the end of the 20th century, Batman had taken on a darker, grittier, and more realistic tone as writers and filmmakers began adding layers of psychological motivation. In the 2005 motion picture, Batman Begins, one of the keys to understanding Batman's psychology lies in a universal emotion, fear. In the film, young Bruce Wayne develops a paralyzing fear of bats. To quite a fall, didn't we, Master Bruce? And why did we fall, Bruce? So we can learn to pick ourselves up. Fear is one of the fundamental psychologies of childhood. And learning how to deal with the fact that we will be afraid, but we will go on to do things despite our fears. You know why they attacked you, don't you? They were afraid of you. Afraid of me. All creatures feel fear. Even the scary ones. Especially the scary ones. One of the interesting things about Batman Begins is it gave us a little more glimpse into the young Bruce Wayne. He tends to be a fearful and anxious kid, which is a very interesting choice in temperament to give him. It's almost like he's starting to have a panic attack in the play where it's a callback to the bats when he fell in the bat cave. Can we go? He causes his parents to leave the theater because he gets really anxious. Please. Okay. Let's go. Central to the uh, Batman mythology is the notion of choice. That's very, very central to everything. The Batman stories portray the alternatives of good and evil, life or death. In Bruce Wayne's case, he was confronted with the most horrible tragedy one could imagine. Wallace, Joey, I'm a bastard. That's fine. Here you go. Hey!
Bruce Wayne is a very plausible character psychologically. Kids generally, even if they're not directly responsible for some terrible event, uh, generally personalize the event and take responsibility for it. Don't be afraid. He feels guilty because his fear caused them to go into this dark alley and they died as a result of it. The death of Bruce Wayne's parents is an integral part of the Batman mythology and was first depicted in the November 1939 issue of Detective Comics. It has continued to be incorporated into almost every telling and retelling of his early history. Here's a kid who, at a very early age, learned that security is temporary, is fragile. It was my fault, Alfred. Oh, I no, made the need to be if my hand gun skipped. It was nothing that you did. It was him. It raises a question, which is, am I ever going to be secure? Is, can I ever trust anybody who won't also be taken away? I miss so Alfred. And Bruce Wayne is a person who essentially has answered that question, I'm never going to be safe, so I better take matters into my own hands. Rachel, this man killed my parents. I cannot let that pass. You have the ultimate psychological moment of Batman there in the courtroom where his parents' murderer is on trial, and he has a gun in his pocket, and he has to decide whether or not to use it. There is a member of the Wayne family here today. Has he got anything to say? That's the character's moment of growth and judgment. When people experience a traumatic event, it often calls into question fundamental beliefs they have. And this is the way that trauma can be a very powerful, positive force in inducing growth. With Bruce Wayne, he became dedicated to avenging, not revenging, but avenging his parents' death and protecting innocent people from criminal acts. And many people, in fact, have experienced the trauma go on and become social activists in some way. What are you seeking? The means to fight injustice, to turn fear against those who prey on the fearful. His strength derives really from this extraordinary motivation he has through the tragedy of his parents' death and, and his attitude to it. And so you're looking at a character who has embarked on this crusade to fight crime. When bringing the character of Bruce Wayne to the screen in Batman Begins, director Christopher Nolan found an unusual psychological parallel in a real-life historical figure, the 26th president of the United States, Theodore Roosevelt. Chris said, to me, the key to understanding the character is that Bruce Wayne is Teddy Roosevelt. Roosevelt's father was New York City's great patrician benefactor. He started the Museum of Natural History. He was one of the founders of the Children's Aid Society. And there's a similarity to Thomas Wayne, who was the great philanthropist of Gotham City. People less fortunate than us have been enduring very hard times. So we build a new cheap public transportation system to unite the city. Like Bruce Wayne, Teddy goes through deep family tragedy. His mother and wife die on the same day. He goes off to the Dakota Badlands, probably to kill himself, reforges himself in that situation, and comes back and becomes this insane police commissioner bicycling through the city in the middle of the night. He's the rough rider, what we know as the iconography of Teddy Roosevelt. That's really the psychology that plays out in Bruce Wayne. Your anger gives you great power, but if you let it, it will destroy you. In the comic book histories, the timely appearance of a bat in Bruce's study gave him the idea for a crime-fighting alter ego that could avenge his parents' death. Originally called the Batman by creator Bob Kane, this second identity was inspired by popular characters like Zorro and the Shadow, wealthy crusaders who cloak their crime fighting behind a secret other self. 
In Batman Begins, the motives for Bruce's transformation are more psychologically based. People need dramatic examples to shake them out of apathy, and I can't do that as Bruce Wayne. But as a symbol, what symbol? Something elemental, something terrifying. In the film, Bruce chooses to adopt the appearance of a bat because it's a creature that embodies one of his greatest fears. The symbolism of using the bat is he's conquered those fears. And there's a technique that mental health clinicians use for people who have fears. It's called exposure. And the idea is in a planned and purposeful way, you expose yourself to the things that you're afraid of. The movie portrayed exposure incredibly well. stays with the fear until he calms down and sees that he's okay. It's just a wonderful example of how people become afraid of things and they can become unafraid of them. The murder of Thomas and Martha Wayne instilled a sense of purpose in the life of their orphaned son. But as Batman, that life is far from easy. And each day, Bruce Wayne's psyche is divided between his normal self and his secret identity, which raises a fascinating question. Who is the real person, Bruce Wayne or Batman? People are dying, Alfred. What would you have me do? Endure, Master Wayne. Take it. They'll hate you for it, but that's the point of Batman. He can be the outcast. He can make the choice that no one else can make. The right choice. For decades, Batman fans have embraced a hero whose character would unnerve us in reality. A man divided between his daytime life as a philanthropist and businessman and his nighttime crusade as a masked avenger who operates outside the law. He is trying to integrate uh, this ever-going conflict that he has between good and evil with the person that he thinks he is, more importantly, the person he wants to be. In the early 20th century, Swiss psychiatrist Carl Jung explored the link between the conscious and the unconscious mind. Jung believed that in all of us, a struggle wages between the socially acceptable self and what Jung called the shadow side. Batman embodies the shadow side. He looks like evil. He operates like an evil guy. Where are you? Here. Ah! He operates outside society, and yet his values are the values of virtuous man. He is a perfect union of the two sides of all of us, the good and the evil that coexist in human life. Theatricality and deception are powerful agents. You must become more than just a man in the mind of your opponent. In the film Batman Begins, Bruce's choice to take on the identity of a bat not only taps into his own childhood <laughs> fears, but into the fear most people have about the flying creatures. In popular culture, a bat is a threat. It comes out at night. It's something you can't really see, but it can bite you, it can suck your blood. So what Batman does is take the iconography of evil. Look at medieval paintings of devils, demons, they have often horns and bat wings. Bats in every culture except the Chinese that I know about are symbols of evil, of the dark side, of death, of Satan. And that fascinates us. People are always fascinated by evil, partially, I think, because it's an unacknowledged part of every one of us. And Batman puts that in your face. Why bats, Master Wayne? Bats frightened me. This time my enemies shared my dread. History has a lot of examples of people taking symbols that are initially negative, uh, initially hateful even, and getting ownership of them. In the Nazi era, uh, homosexuals were branded or forced to wear a pink triangle. Well, uh, in recent decades, the pink triangle has become a symbol of liberation for homosexuals. Bruce Wayne's done the same thing. He's taken a symbol of all that is scary, unpredictable, and chaotic in the night, in the world, and owned it. By the same token, you could say that the choice of a bat 
which is able to you know, soar above society, you know, upwards towards the heavens, you know, represents this aspirational purpose or dynamic that seems to be motivating his behavior. Well, well, you took my advice about theatricality a bit, literally. He's created this, this symbol, and, and that symbol can't have limits. He can't show weakness ever. And so you have the fight between what is good for Bruce Wayne and what is the right thing to do for Batman, and the two of them are not always compatible. Of course, there are other ways of channeling anger and loss, like psychotherapy. Well, why doesn't Batman just go into therapy? Why does Bruce Wayne just go into therapy uh, and then be cured of Batman? The reality is that the Batman persona is the true persona, in our opinion, the way we handle the stories, and that Bruce Wayne is the mask. Batman is just a symbol, Rachel. No, this is your mask. Your real face is the one that criminals now fear. Which is the true man? The Bat or Bruce Wayne? Since the birth of the superhero era, a lot of psychologists have talked about the multiple roles that we play in everyday life. There's an identity that we play with our spouses, identity we play with the co-workers who work beneath us, and the co-workers who work above us. For Batman, you've got the billionaire playboy, which I think most people would say is not the real person, and that's just a persona, it's an act. Then you've got Bruce Wayne when he's not playing the playboy, and then you have Bruce Wayne when he's wearing the Batman costume. They're facets of the same core personality. Which is the real identity? Is it Bruce Wayne or is it Batman? And I think that the really cool answer, of course, would be to say, oh, it's Batman. But I think that that misses the point. And what defines the character is the essential humanity that Bruce Wayne possesses. You are my greatest student. It should be you standing by my side, saving the world. I'll be standing where I belong. Between you and the people of Gotham. The core of his identity always remains Bruce because it's his formative experience as Bruce that fuels both. Batman is a tool he puts on to accomplish what he needs to do. If Batman's true personality remains a subject of debate, so do his motives for fighting crime. History and fiction are filled with figures who remind us that one person's hero is another person's vigilante. In the letter of the law, Batman is a vigilante. He has identified the white and the black, uh, the right and the wrong, and lives by that code much more strictly than anybody else does. <laughs> Laws are open to interpretation. Batman's law is not. Where were the other drugs going? I don't know. I swear to God. Swear to me! We have always glorified various vigilantes, whether we're talking about Robin Hood, robbing from the rich and uh, giving to the poor. There is this persona that makes us feel good. The problem is that when we start engaging those behaviors in an organized society, in a way that allows the citizenry to make a determination about who should be punished and how and when, we run the risk that their idea might not match up with the idea of the masses. What he's doing is really outside the law. But as a citizen of Gotham, he really didn't have any choice because the law was so corrupt, he couldn't work within the law. But on the other hand, Batman has one rule. He will not take a life. I will not become an executioner. He's got systems that he orders his behavior by to try and restrain his natural instinct for violence or for revenge or whatever dark impulses that drive him. A lot of what makes him Batman is the ability to control himself, to be able to be disciplined. In many situations in life, success requires that we regulate our impulses. Somebody drives into a parking space ahead of us, and instead of ramming into him, which I'd love to do, I, I suppress that. I exert self-control. <sighs> Self-regulation is like a muscle. We have, all of us, a muscular ability to regulate our impulses. Bruce Wayne is a man who's developed that muscle. He has worked that muscle out. So now he has a stronger capacity for self-regulation than anyone else. 
That's almost his superpower. The power of self-control. If you finally learn to do what is necessary, I won't kill you. Occasionally, Batman's critics have accused him of suffering from a hero complex, an obsessive compulsion to help others and right wrongs, as defined by psychologist Carl Jung. Batman had this obsession with keeping things under control and uh, making sure that the law is obeyed and that the innocent are not hurt. But his obsession leads him to pretty much cut out from his life anything that doesn't add to his mission as Batman. He's obsessive compulsive about that. I brought a story once where he's in the middle of an important business meeting and it's late in the afternoon. He's discussing million dollar business and he stops paying attention and he's simply watching the sun go down. And the second the sun vanishes behind the horizon, he goes, meeting's over, I gotta go. He cannot stop being Batman. It's much easier to stop being Bruce Wayne. Uh, so once you understand that, then you can understand why he is motivated and why he continues to behave in the way he does. Batman's behavior includes his choice to deny himself a lasting romantic relationship. You once told me that we'd be together. Bruce, don't make me your one hope for a normal life. Did you mean it? Yes. Bruce Wayne's very capable of falling in love. You might even say that's his Achilles heel, almost his kryptonite. He can have the greatest technology in the world, the greatest weapons in the world, but his heart has no shield. His heart can be broken. So if you're Bruce Wayne, falling in love is a very dangerous thing because uh, it's possible that the person that you fall in love with will get hurt as a direct function of that person's affiliation with you. You look nervous. <laughs> he doesn't want to love that openly with the fear that that person might be lost to him the same way his parents were. This is what makes him a hero. It's easy to make a choice if it has no consequences for you. With Batman, the consequences are monumental, not just life and death, but the kind of life that he lives. Though Batman recognizes the line dividing justice and injustice, other Gotham creatures of the night see no such distinction. And these denizens of darkness relish the chance to perform acts of unspeakable evil. And here we go. It's okay. No one's gonna hurt you. Of course they are. Crane? No. Scarecrow. Their names have become iconic. The Joker. Scarecrow. Riddler. Penguin. Catwoman. Two-Face. In the annals of superhero history, Batman's enemies are the most psychologically scarred, walking definitions of dysfunction, whose vicious deeds often evoke the violent and perverse acts of real-life criminals. One of the most enduring things about Batman is his rogues gallery, the villains. Because, as I like to say, the rogues define the hero. The greater the threat, the greater the hero. <laughs> Demonstrating everything from psychopathology to narcissism, Batman's arch enemies also offer twisted mirror images of Batman himself. His villains, like Batman, experienced a tragedy. But he responded by saying, I'm gonna spend my life restoring justice to the world. His villains didn't make that choice. There are plenty of villains that are just as obsessed but they feel that anything bad that happened to them is something that they need to get payback from the world from, you know. Whereas Batman had the exact opposite point of view. Something bad happened to me, I'm gonna make sure it never happens to anybody else. Every one of the villains takes what Batman uses as a strength and makes it a weakness. So therefore, Batman sees how his methodologies can go horribly wrong if he goes over a certain line. Penguin is bureaucracy gone bad. If Batman or Bruce Wayne let his foundation be used immorally, he could become what Penguin is. As depicted in the film The Dark Knight, Harvey Dent, also known as Two-Face, is a prime example of a Batman hero turned tragic villain. 
Harvey Dent is one of the great characters from the comics, and he has a fantastically interesting arc because he's somebody who starts out as a good guy. He is a DA. The night is darkest just before the dawn. But then a great tragedy happens to him, and he becomes something else. You either die a hero. No! Or you live long enough to see yourself become the villain. Harvey Dent ends up being scarred by one of his adversaries and completely loses his mind. But half the time, he's sympathetic and compelling, and the other half, he's as dangerous as a human being can be. Two-Face is having trouble with the duality, can't reconcile the two halves of himself, has to flip a coin to choose whether to do good or evil. Something freeing about that, also something extremely disturbing, because he's given up his own sense of responsibility because of the coin. Two-Face could be described as exhibiting a dissociative disorder, a person who literally is giving you two personalities. When someone begins to truly develop an alternative identity or a true alter ego, we move from what may be the normal to something much darker, much more pathologic, in fact, ultimately, quite psychotic. Other psychological ailments are clearly expressed by many of Batman's villains. The Riddler can't commit a crime without leaving behind a self-incriminating clue, the classic calling card of a narcissist. Individuals who are narcissistic, they engage in the behaviors because they want to be noticed. You can look at someone like Ted Bundy, who committed uh, a series of homicides. And yet he loved that he could thumb his nose in the face of law enforcement, giving them clues of where bodies were left, pointing in many respects to himself and defying them to catch him. That type of attention-seeking behavior is narcissism. Would you like to see my mask? I use it in my experiments. In Batman Begins, the Scarecrow is one of the most terrifying of villains. These crazies, they can't stand it. A sadist in the position of power. Ah! Ah! We meet the Scarecrow as a doctor at Arkham Asylum. He's used that entrusted place to experiment with chemicals and drugs. <laughs> He enjoys watching people's minds completely snap as a result of the use of it. There is nothing to fear but fear itself. Scarecrow uses fear as a tool to ultimately get what he wants, independent of what it might cost others. This is an individual generally not psychotic, but very intense in their need to self-aggrandize. A individual like the Unabomber, Theodore Kaczynski, part of his delusions is that mechanization and modernization is ruining the world and takes it upon himself to send bombs to computer scientists, professors. He became vengeful. I'm going to take it on in society, and thus becomes this murderous, crazy person. Eventually, each Batman villain ends up, however briefly, in Arkham Asylum, Gotham's Institute for the Criminally Insane. But do villains like Scarecrow and Two-Face truly meet the legal definition of insanity? In every psychiatric text that's published, you will find nowhere on any of its pages the word insane. Because insane is illegal, not a clinical term. And here's the best example of why the public can be so confused. Jeffrey Dahmer. How can a person who kills his victims, cuts them up, has their heads in the freezer, not be crazy? And yet, he did not meet the test of insanity in Wisconsin. The test for insanity is knowing that the act was wrong and not having the ability to conform behavior. He doesn't meet that test. He did it because he wanted to. While most Batman villains operate under the influence of some form of psychosis, 
one rival is completely in control of her faculties, the whip-wielding jewel thief, Selena Kyle, also known as Catwoman. Over the years, Batman and Catwoman have had a complicated on-again, off-again relationship. But Catwoman's villainous nature hasn't stopped Batman from pursuing her for reasons other than her crimes. Catwoman is one of the few people in the world who wouldn't be in the kind of danger your average woman would be with Batman. She's as dangerous as he is. So he found someone who was kind of his equal. Batman's well known to have had a dalliance and more than a dalliance with Catwoman. They have an affinity and a lot in common in terms of dressing up and jumping off rooftops. But ultimately, Catwoman, while not a terrible person, uh, crosses a line that Bruce Wayne and Batman don't cross. Batman still operates within a moral code that's quite strict. So this is the challenge for Catwoman and Batman, as attractive as she is in all of her incarnations. He cannot accept her because even as lines between right and wrong are gray, he still sees those lines and he won't cross them. Lust, greed, revenge, and a hunger for attention are all compulsions that can lead a human being into a life of crime. But the Dark Knight's deadliest enemy is perhaps the most difficult to fathom. Arm robbery, double homicide, got a taste for the theatrical like you. And to unlock his secrets requires a journey into the ultimate heart of darkness. <laughs> A year ago, these uh, cops and lawyers wouldn't dare cross any of you. I mean, what happened? So what are you proposing? It's simple. Kill the Batman. <laughs> of all the evildoers in Batman's universe, none is more explosive or unpredictable than the homicidal nemesis known simply as the Joker. He represents a kind of chaos, of meaninglessness, of randomness, the idea of the character of the Joker, just the, the, the luck of the cards. Here's my card. Introduced by DC Comics in 1940, the Joker initially had no backstory. Over the years, several versions of his history have been written, describing the character's maniacal metamorphosis. One involves a tragedy in which the Joker fell into a vat of chemicals and became disfigured as a result. The accident not only changed his appearance, but also twisted his mind. You don't know what makes him tick. Maybe he won't kill you. Maybe he'll hand you a thousand dollar bill. He'll probably kill you, but you can't be sure. So in that way, he's a perfect villain for Batman. Most characters can justify the terrible things they do as I'm doing this for my family, I'm doing this because the world hates me, I'm doing this because... Pick an answer. The Joker does it because I'm as nutty as a squirrel, and I'm proud of that. Some men aren't looking for anything logical. They can't be bought, bullied, reasoned, or negotiated with. Evening, Commissioner. Some men just want to watch the world burn. Let's put a smile on that face. <laughs> Most criminals are motivated by the desire to gain greater wealth or gain greater power. Les, I have kids to feed. Do I don't like falafel? Or to exact some form of revenge. There's a clear motivation which is understandable for what's prompting their behavior. In the case of Somebody who's mentally ill, you can't necessarily predict what they're going to do because their motivations are not the normal ones. For example, an individual such as John Hinckley, who believed amidst his psychosis and narcissism that if he were to assassinate the President of the United States, Jodie Foster would fall in love with him. You see quickly where the logic in that line of thought falls apart. Why so serious? And the Joker has an agenda of chaos. He's a unique villain 
in that he is not even necessarily after money or power or, or any of those traditional things. So that's really the hardest kind of evil to fight because you can't bargain with it. Well, hello, beautiful. In the dark night, the battle between Batman and the Joker is taken to the ultimate level. A little fight in here. I like that. And you're gonna love me. I always felt, as Batman, that there was a great curiosity about this Joker because he hadn't come across anybody like him before. This is another character like himself who will not compromise whatsoever. I think the Joker is the, uh, the logical response to uh, a character like Batman. Partly because Batman, having raised this extremity of behavior in Gotham, you know, he's putting on a mask, tapping into people's fears, and there's all of the technology he employs. He's distinguishing himself to fight crime. Now there's a Batman. And that immediately raises the question of, is he prepared to go outside the law? How far is he prepared to, to bend the rules? They are dark reflections of each other. They're both men who operate outside of normal social norms. They're both highly talented, highly gifted at what they do. So they have a lot in common. Every yin has a yang, every positive has a negative. Batman is sane and logical, uses his mind to solve problems and solve crimes, and the Joker is a complete raving lunatic. Batman says, philosophically, we can acknowledge an imperfect world, we can acknowledge that we have to step outside of social norms, but that doesn't make the social norms meaningless. The Joker says, the presence of random injustice means that there is no justice. The fact that innocence can be destroyed means there is no innocence. So your life is a joke. Now, when someone says your life is a joke, that's a challenge. It's not just a physical challenge. It's a moral challenge. It's an intellectual challenge. And Batman can't let that go. Because the Joker isn't just threatening him physically. He's threatening the premise of Batman's existence. That's why it's such an epic discussion that they're having. And of course, it's played out physically. It's played out in fights and punches and gunshots. Ultimately, it's a philosophical conflict, and not one that's easily resolved. The Joker wants to see that everybody has a price, that nobody is pure, and that even Batman can be bought or can be leveraged in such a way that he would compromise his principles. Whatever the psychological cause of characters like the Joker, the villains of Batman have given us indelible images of the power of the human mind and its capacity for cruelty. Everyone has the capacity to do evil, and everyone has the capacity to do good. Holocaust survivor Viktor Frankl talks about the last of the human freedoms. It's the attitude one is going to adopt towards life. That's the fundamental choice that we retain no matter what we are experiencing, no matter where we are. That notion of choice is fundamental to the Batman personality. I've seen now what would have to become to stop men like him. Batman represents the incredible power that one enjoys when one consistently chooses the same direction, makes the same choice and the right one, to champion good, to choose to affirm life, Beyond the thrill of his adventures, Batman gives the world something greater. His internal struggles offer insight into the origins of our own fears, the motivations behind evil acts, and the ways that an ordinary human being can become a hero. He's human. He's one of the few superheroes that's just a normal guy who's willingly dedicated himself to fighting crime, but it's, it's conceivable that it, it could be you or me. 
We don't come from Krypton. We don't have superpowers or mutant genes. Batman is in the realm of obtainable. I think Batman's the most relatable of, of superheroes because he's not really technically a superhero. He doesn't have any superpowers except his extraordinary capacity for self-discipline. He is what we aspire to be in terms of his power, his wealth, the things that he's able to do. And because of that, we identify very heavily with this man who is struggling with the very things that you and I struggle with every day. We try to build upon our strengths and we try to minimize those things that are weaknesses. We try to figure out what's going on in this crazy world. Batman reflects the full spectrum of emotional angst and joy and sorrow that each and every one of us experience in life. Bruce is certainly suffering, sacrificing in many ways from this character of Batman, who he has unleashed and who he's really unable to um, rein in anymore. You're getting lost inside this monster of yours. I'm using this monster to help other people just like my father did. Batman does sit on top of this mountain of anger. I think he's more in control of it than he wants his adversaries to think. He wants his adversaries to think that he might lose it at any minute and kill them, you know. Do I look like a cop? It works in his favor that you think he's completely unpredictable, which really the Batman myth speaks to. I mean, it's all about where's this thing that I never thought could happen going to come from? You know, who's going to step out of the shadows and kill somebody I love? Some people talk about Batman as a damaged individual, as a person who is still playing out his childhood wounds. I don't find that a very compelling interpretation because that doesn't make him a hero. Makes it, if he's damaged, he's less than us. Batman's a hero, he's more than us. I find compelling the interpretation that says, here's a man who faced tragedy, and he made some choices to rise above it. He used that tragedy to improve himself and to improve the world. That is a hero. That makes him compelling. The appeal of Batman has been in part to the idea that if something that tragic happened to me, would I have that kind of ability to shape my life that way? I can't tell you how many people who have contacted me and said, I went through tragedy and turned it into a victory. And the Batman's image was ever before my eyes, and I used that image to get myself out of the depths of despair. He's flying on rooftop! The best thing about Batman is he's not really a superhero. He's a human. Like your father, you lack the courage to do all that is necessary. And he shows us the greatness of what humans can be. I am going to stop you. The reason the Batman is a hero is because he's on our side. He is the balance. He is the cosmic balance to all the insanity. Hit me! Batman says, we can make meaning in a difficult world. We can pursue justice in an unjust world. Batman's a character that provides us hope that all of us need.